So what's the deal with diving chronographs? You hear speak about them very often. You hear brands releasing them, possibly not to critical acclaim. And many of us in this space don't understand their purpose, their merits, what they mean. You hear words like oxymoron being thrown around a lot when we consider what the watch is. And it's essentially a dive watch that has a diving bezel and a chronograph complication. Now, if we had to step back and look at the different genres of pieces, sports watches, dress watches, in these areas, we have things like perpetual calendars, we have annual calendars, tourbillons. But if we move into the sports section, we see that generally is broken down to dive watches and chronographs for the most part. And the issue is that the diving chronograph feels like a genre all to itself that many of us don't understand. So before looking at a handful of pieces, I will try to explain my thoughts around the diver chronograph, what it means and what they are trying to do with this concept. We do have some really hardcore divers who do watch this channel and I'm sure they'll want to give their two cents as well. So I think from a marketing and business perspective, what it allows you to do as a manufacturer is create more complexity with quite a simple formula. Up the scale of the dive watch a little bit. Give the person the practicality of a dive bezel as well as the added feature of a chronograph. In a way, it's very much a package deal. You're getting so many more features for your money, which is a huge bonus. But then it also raises the question of whether or not these brands are just throwing all of these parts together and hoping something will stick. If I was a frequent diver, using a diving chronograph, this is how I think the process would work. Before getting off the boat, you would start the chronograph. Let that run as you're in the water. Use the bezel for its natural function for timing your decompression stops, all the while knowing how long your dive has been. That's the long and short of it, I believe. Might be completely wrong here. A lot of these watches that we will look at don't allow you to use the pushes underwater, so it kind of renders that complication moot. The dive bezel can be used for the purpose of timing a dive, but Traditionally, it was used to time your decompression stops as you would surface. And I guess in a way, having this added complication of a chronograph that's running as a consistent marker for you to use allows for you to judge your dive time a lot more accurately, as long as you can read the dial, of course. But let's now get into the design of these pieces and what I think is great about them in particular. One area that I don't understand why people never discuss is, from a creative point of view, Designing a diver chronograph is a serious challenge. Why? Well, you need it to not only be legible, but also functional and visually appealing all at the same time. You're putting all of this information in one place and it has to be usable. So instead of judging the watch by its complication, rather judge them by their designs. How well do they manage to communicate both the chronograph function and the dive watch aesthetic? From this, we can learn how these brands address these subjects and actually, we can appreciate the details and aesthetics of these watches a lot more. So we begin with a basic vintage reissue dive watch, the Oris Divers 65 diving chronograph. Now I've just done a review of the Oris 65 with the original dial, but this one, with the simpler batons and plot approach, looks much more legitimate as a diving chronograph. In fact, the way the dial has been addressed, you can see that the architecture has been shared very well here. Not only do you have a bezel that is fully graduated, but you have two sub-dials that manage to sit so comfortably in between all the plots. And you can easily take your eye away from the dial to the sub-dials. This is a very clear example, we could say almost a neutral approach to designing a diving chronograph. And as a starting point, it's very good to see how you can get so much legibility out of both features, but at the same time make a very competent looking instrument. Of course, these models have different accents, different colors, but the theme remains the same. Two sub-dials and a very legible dial. Then we jump to the more beefed up cousin in the Oris line, which is the Aquas chronograph. And here we see the same features are shared again, in a more subtle way, but still holding true to the Aquas aesthetic. And when you're dealing with a dial that is generally so sparse, with basic batons that run around it, incorporating a chronograph complication is much easier. In fact, it requires a lot less effort. On the subdials at the top by the 12 and at the 6, we see minutes and hours easily designated there, so you can read it simply. The running seconds at the nine o'clock position. Even though this configuration is asymmetrical, you can also appreciate where the logo has been placed on the right-hand side. And if not anything else, the form of this watch definitely communicates its tool watch utilitarian intent. 
Then we move to one of my favorite watches in this category, which is the Omega Seamaster Professional Diving Chronograph. And I guess what makes it look like such an appealing watch for my eye is they've just been able to clean up that negative space a bit more and put some more detail into the dial. Even though this watch does have a strange aesthetic with the James Bond skeletonized hands and the helium escape valve on the left hand side, for some strange reason it really works. And maybe it's down to the relationship between the parts. How instead of only having two crowns, you now have two added pushes, ceramic coated, that can also be used in the water, so that's a big bonus. Contrasting colors and materials, rubber, being used as a very complementary component to this model. And then we start looking at other nuances like two tones, how those colors can also create quite a harmonious relationship between the subdials, the hands, batons, bezels. I hope you're seeing how fun of an exercise this can be creatively, trying to maximize the function of the watch using a very limited amount of space. Also dealing with a lot of elements and small areas. The Zin Easy M13, another extremely overbuilt watch for this purpose, but manages to address all of these aspects well because of its German design language. The use of line weight on the dial, where the subdials are placed, and now more attention to how space is allocated to all of these elements. This model does manage to communicate its militaristic, we could say aggressive intent by how it's been done, and there isn't another watch like this on the list. The Audemars Piguet Offshore Diver Chronograph. As we've seen how popular these bright spot colors have become recently, these watches were one of the few to do it first, and with it we see a lot of playfulness, yes, but we also see some very good stylistic choices there with the use of color on the inset bezel, for example, how the two subdials have been arranged equally apart, how you see we are dealing with a compressor crown, but even still the royal oak aesthetic is there. We could say it has been tampered with in many ways, but as a vibrant, quite adventurous looking piece in the line, does a very good job. I can't emphasize enough how well color has been used here with all of these different models and how this contrast manages to communicate the various functions of the subdials, say, in relation to the minute hand and the inset bezel. The Breitling Super Ocean Heritage B01. Now there are many others in this line. Breitling is quite well known for their idea of using turning bezels and chronograph complications. But this one is quite distinct in the way that it calls back to its past, looking at reissue chronographs and reissue dive watches. It's not the most practical or functional piece on this list because as you can see, the bezel doesn't have any numerals on it. The subdials are extremely small and could be scaled up. But in a way, we've been looking at some very overbuilt watches in this category. This on the other hand feels more like a dress piece, a much more casual looking dive watch that also has the added feature of a chronograph on top of it. The Seiko Prospex C Solar. We know Seiko are big with their diving chronographs too, but this one has a few other features. I particularly like the Save the Ocean variant with the blue accents. In many ways, it does look like a typical Seiko dive watch, but you can see how well handled the subdials, the main dial, everything together looks correct. There doesn't seem like there were many second thoughts with this piece. Bear in mind the use of color and the watch's overall presence on the wrist doesn't actually attract much attention, which we find that many other divers in this category do because they are scaled more in the areas of 44 millimeters. Now we move into a completely different bracket looking at the Ulysse Nardin Diver Chronograph. And it's a beautiful looking watch. It's possibly one of the best on this list. We know Ulysse Nardin's history with nautical inspirations, but this feels so much more built for purpose. It does look like an engineer's watch, but in the way it presents itself, it doesn't shout about it either. Everything feels like it was considered, like the red accents on the hands, how there is a great texture to the dials. And even though it's a luxury brand that does pride itself on the elegance of its pieces, these feel like serious tool watches. Also noticing a great relationship between the bezel knurling and the case design. Everything looks hard edged and rigid. Stunning looking pieces that highlight the genre very well. And then we move to the original establisher, one of the original divers in many ways, the Blanc Pound 50 Fathoms Diving Chronograph. I think of all the pieces in the categories that we've looked at, this one doesn't seem to represent the diving chronograph as well as it could. And in a way, we are so used to seeing the quarter Arabics on these pieces that it looks a bit strange without them there. But we must bear in mind that it's a flyback chronograph complication. These watches are extremely well regulated and tested. Maybe the reason why it feels a bit strange is because of the 12 at the top of the dial. If they had to eliminate that completely and instead stuck with batons, 
would probably have a better, clearer aesthetic overall. A watch that has been addressed much better, in fact, much better than its standard diver counterpart, is the bathyscaphe. The issue with the standard bathyscaphe is we have very small plots around the dial. With an added chronograph complication on top of it, you can see that the space has been shared a lot better here. It almost feels like this watch was designed around a chronograph first, and it looks much more competent this way. Notice the small details like the loom pip on the running sub-seconds. It manages to be a very elegant looking dive watch with traditional inspired aesthetics, also very 70s in the way it's been done. And of all the watches we've looked at already, this is probably the most tasteful and unassuming in this category. To cap off this series, we can look at some of the most extreme in this area, the Jeje Le Coutre Master Compressor Diving Chronograph. These watches were built to be extreme, to go to the extremes, and represent that very well. Some of these may be very gaudy in appearance, I would agree, but they also do some very stylistic things with the running seconds, for example, how the subdials have crazed, stretched numerals on them, how others have very compact looking dials and large hands. The actual compressor feature to these watches is fascinating when you adjust the crown. And then last but not least in this category, one of the most beautiful but also traditional watches is the original Master Compressor Diving Chronograph, built almost directly in tandem with the Diving Memovox of the time. These watches from Gégé Le Coutre were very much ahead of their time. And yes, not everything may make sense, but you do see a very elegant form to how the dial has been done, how the subdials have been put together so neatly, how the bezel looks out of the way, in fact. And I think this goes full circle around the discussion where we talk about the idea of mixing the complication of a chronograph with a dive watch. We notice that it's not a new thing, that brands have been experimenting with diving chronographs for a very long time, just some have done it better than others. The overbuilt nature of some of these pieces does divide opinion. The whole complication and setup of these watches also head scratching at times. But I think we can all enjoy that when we look at these watches, we look at them from a more creative mindset and how the people behind these designs manage to address them in such a way that they don't only look competent, but are also extremely functional and semi-practical. The jury is still out about whether or not these pieces make great additions to a collection, whether they should make sense or shouldn't, if sports watches should be designated to the dive watch and chronograph category separately, not combining the two. I would be very interested in hearing your thoughts about these watches, but also what do you think the complications would do together and just how practical they can be in everyday life.